Thanks, Duncan. So it's a really tough game, right? Like seriously tough. And really you're having a mare. It's a total mare. Depends on your sport now, whether you can stop to think about this. But you've just got this split second and you think, oh God, I'm slaughtering myself here. I mean, my reputation's in tatters. It's my fault. I'm so screwed it up. Right, I'm scared. I've got to be safe here. How do I get out of it? Fight? Flight? Get off as soon as the game's over. Get out, get out of there. Get your head down. Don't want the ball if it's a team sport. Hide. Freeze. Panic. If you want to talk about being under pressure in a way that nobody understands but you, think of sport as the school of your discipleship. This is where you will work out your salvation. Nobody gets it like a sportswoman. That horror when it's a bad day. But it's the scared meets, I've got to survive this. My reputation is going to be in tatters. Help. Come with me to the other side of the spectrum in your school of discipleship. It does go wrong. It's a bit of a shocker. You've got a split second to think about it. And you just say to yourself, <laughs> is it nonsense, I'm having a shocker. But I'm safe. Just this moment, perhaps in your sport, somebody taught me to do this. You can go, I'm safe. I'm not scared, I'm safe. Why am I safe? Graham, why are you safe? I'm safe because it doesn't matter if I'm brilliant or terrible. It doesn't matter what I achieve, I have received new life. I am loved. Nothing can snatch it away. Nothing has been created. No gift of mine, no relationships can take away that I'm safe. God loves me and he made me this player. And sometimes it's Good Friday in sport. Mostly it's Good Friday in my sporting life. Sometimes it's Easter Sunday. But on those Good Fridays, I'm safe. And here's the next thing you can do. I can serve. I'm scared, I've got to survive. I'm scared, God. I've got to survive against that lot who will take away my pride. Or I'm safe here. I, I'm, a, I'm a football coach. I'm safe here. There's 15 to go. We're 4-1 down. We're having a shock. It's my fault. I'm in charge. You know what, Lord? I'm safe. Good times come. Bad times come. I'm looking around me now. I can serve these people. I can serve them. I'm not going to curl up and die. I'm not going to fight or flight or freeze. I'm going to serve. Come on, Jesus. Come on, Jesus. This is my school of discipleship. I was born for this. You put me here. You wired me up for this. I've loved it since I'm a kid. I know you've got to lose or win. Lord, I'm in. I'm in. I'm safe. Come on. Let me serve. Oh, my lovely, lovely colleagues, even though you're miles younger than me. I know you get this when I say it. And it's fantastic. Christian and sport. Now, here's the question for us tonight. Look at the title of the talk, The Grace That Transforms Lives. Well, how is it going to transform my life in that school of discipleship where people see me all the time at my best and mostly at my worst? It's not a game, this. This is a vocation. A divinely granted gift and skill set to play. 2 Peter 4. 2 Peter 2 verses 4 to 12. I think, though written, as Duncan just told us, to a range of people across the Roman Empire, I think it can help us today to see the answer to how God transforms my life today in the middle of the athletic event. Have a go with me. I'm going to take it in three parts, following Peter and trying to bring him into your life and mine today. First, Peter shows us here that Christ is the foundation. Note the key word. Christ is the foundation of a new life. Verses 4, 6, 7, and 8. So heads in or up, definitely not at me, worst place to look. Bible, screen, follow the words. Here we go. Notice, it's so obvious, right? Stick with it for a minute. There's a building metaphor in play. This may not excite you very much. Stick with the building metaphor for a minute. I promise you will make sense of it if you're not a civil engineer. Here we go. 
Look at the highlighted words, stone, builder, building. As you come to him, Jesus, the living stone, rejected by humans, but chosen by God and precious to him. Verse 6, for in scripture it says, see I lay a stone in Zion, a chosen and precious cornerstone, and the one who trusts in him will never be put to shame. That's a quote from Isaiah. Second quote, now to you who believe this stone is precious, but to those who do not believe, the stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. Psalm 118, stick with me. And thirdly, a stone that causes people to stumble and a rock that makes them fall, Isaiah chapter 8. They stumble because they disobey the message, which is what they were destined for. Right, here we go, for all non-engineers. What's going on here is really quite simple. Peter decides to use a building metaphor. And here's the key metaphor. Jesus is the cornerstone. Before modern engineering techniques and computers, the cornerstone, as far as I read it, as a philosopher, so I've got no chance, is basically the cornerstone of a building is what it's all built around. I like to think of it like a jigsaw. It's a thousand-word jigsaw, a thousand-piece jigsaw. You can have nearly all the pieces right, but you get one corner wrong. And whatever you do, you just can't quite get it right. And if you tried to build a house in the old days, and you didn't take account of the cornerstone and build around it and its shape and its development and its manoeuvring, then your house was going to be in a state. So he's making a pretty simple point. How will you treat Jesus in the first instance? Is he the cornerstone of your life? That's it. Jigsaw, corner. Um, I don't know, if you want to be a bit more boffin-like, um, the Ptolemaic view of the world in the 16th century to the 16th century of the planets was that all the planets move around the Earth. And this rascal called Copernicus comes along and gets into all sorts of trouble for saying, no, no, the sun's at the middle, the planets move around the sun. And he got into all sorts of trouble for it. But in due course, people said, oh, no wonder we couldn't make sense of the planets. Until you knew the sun was at the middle of the planet, of the planet, you could not make sense of where things were in the universe. But once you knew the sun was the center and everything moved around it, it all made sense. Lots of ways of looking at the same picture here. Jesus Christ, says Peter, to these people all over the empire and to you and me tonight. Here's the first big thing to grasp according to him here. Christ is the absolute foundation of someone's life. But it gets more significant. Look, if you reject Christ, verse 7, for those who believe Christ is precious, but to those who don't believe the stone the builders rejected has become a cornerstone, a stone that causes people to stumble and a rock that makes them fall. He's so pivotal to life that if you don't build your life around him, you are going to trip up over him. However you try and fit your life together, Christ will keep showing up. The human heart is wired up to know that there's a God there. And so if Christ isn't the cornerstone, things don't quite fit. But even more importantly, you will meet him one day and he will say, you knew it didn't fit. You knew it was wrong not to have me at the corner of your life. You knew I was the foundation. Why did you do that, you rebel? And the Bible is clear, there's a judgment to come. But the wonder of grace that we heard of this morning from Duncan is pretty straightforward. Is Christ your cornerstone tonight? I trust he is. And if in any doubt, this may just be the day of your life. At this conference, and it's happened for 30 or 40 years at this conference, year after year after year, somebody's left this conference and said, I gave my life to Christ. I really made him the cornerstone of my life. He is my saviour and lord now. He is my rescuer. Right. That's the first point. But now, Get your brain in gear now and come with me, you lovely athlete. Come with me to the next stage of what Peter wants to say to all of us for how our lives are transformed. Because having Christ as the cornerstone brings us into a new relationship with God. What does that look like? Look with me at the next section. Christ is the builder of a new life. Because Peter keeps going on the building metaphor. Let me just snapshot it as we go into the second part. Jesus is going to build a life with you. He is up for it. 
He is taking a lead in it. He is all over this. You think you've seen a good coach, you've never seen a coach like him. You think you've had a best friend, you've never had a best friend like him. You think you've got somebody who'll stick with you when you really screw it up. You've never had somebody like him. He loves you. He is incredible. He will never, ever, ever let me go in my horrible screw-ups in life. Never. So he is determined to build a new life for me and for you once he becomes our foundational cornerstone in the metaphor. Come with it. Come with it. Come with Peter. Look at 4A. Four, four as you come to him, it says in verse 4, as you come to him, as you respond to him, verse 5, you like living stones, do you see the passive, are being built. Let's make no mistake about this. Jesus Christ, by the Holy Spirit, is building something beautiful in you. He started it, he will finish it. <laughs> he just will finish it. It's a passive thing. He's in charge. He's the leader of this relationship. And let me read on verse 5. You're being built into a spiritual house, or in some translations, a temple of the Spirit, to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. I wish he'd get off the building thing, wouldn't you? But he won't, so we've got to stay with it. But stick your head in with me here. And this is unbelievably magnificent. Don't let me do the work on my own, right? Don't stare at me like in a gormless way. Look at the passage, get your brain on it, and see what you think of this. Come on, I've done the work, you do it with me now. Here we go. He says, I'm going to use a metaphor of the temple in Jerusalem. This letter was written to this whole group of people shortly before the Jerusalem temple in 70 AD was smashed to the ground by the Romans. So there was a temple, but the odds are most of these people had never been there because they lived hundreds or even thousands of miles away. But they all knew about it. This magnificent building where God lived and the priests were the intermediaries and they made sacrifices in the house of God so that everybody could try and have a relationship with God. Watch how the New Testament deconstructs this in my life and yours. I am the house. I and you are the priesthood. And you and I are the sacrifices. Watch this. Oh my gosh, if you get this, honestly now, your partnership with Christ becomes electric for the rest of your life. There's never a dull day. There's always a day where he's at work in you. It's not about years ago when you became a Christian or when you were a child. It's now, it's living, it's vibrant. Why? Have a look closely with me. Here we go, three things. House, priesthood, sacrifices, all temple language. First, you're being built into a spiritual house. Doesn't everybody love to restrain Christianity to a building? Oh, what a beautiful cathedral. Oh, yes, what a lovely church it is. They meet there for two hours on a Sunday, and they're about four hours a week in that church building. Oh, it's an awesome, beautiful old building in Cambridge. I live in Cambridge. Lovely. The New Testament says, no, 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 no. No, you don't meet God in a building. I tell you where you meet God. You want to go to an awesome place to see God? You want to go to where he hangs out in the most awesome, beautiful building? Show up in Nottingham tonight. Walk into the lecture theatre and go, wowzers. Look at that lot. It's the house of God. No, no, but that's what it is. You are the building. You are the building. Wherever you go, Christ is there. Oh, God, that's ridiculous, right? Wherever you go, Christ is there. And it's more awesome than Westminster Abbey. Now that's good for me because I'm not a looker and I like that. Like I am awesome in this regard. Come with me a bit further. You don't find God in a building or the world loves to find God in a building. Where do you go to church? <laughs> well, I've got a church in this building here a couple of hours a week. But uh, to be fair, I am the church. <laughs> I'm with you now. No, but do you see the revolution? Do you see the revolution? We're revolutionaries. It's ridiculous. We're the revolution of Jesus. That's who we are. In the dress, all right, I'll get to that. In the dress, oh, in the dressing room, when you cross the white line, when you dive in the pool, the house of God is there. <laughs> oh boy, vibrant. But he goes on further. Look, to be a holy priesthood. As you come to him, verse 4, you are being built into a holy priesthood. Doesn't the world love special intermediaries? 
They love people who are the religious gurus, the religious authorities. If Jesus showed up on earth, most people would say, oh, hello, I'll take you to the vicar. Because you take them to the religious intermediary. Peter says, no, 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 that's gone, that's gone. Listen, we're talking buildings, we're talking temples. I'll tell you what, there's no special religious intermediaries anymore, no gurus. Who are they then? You. You're the priest. You can talk to God anytime you want. You don't need an intermediary. Can you bear it? In your worst moments in life, when you're glad nobody in the world that can see you, the one who loves you so deeply says, talk to me now. I know you're really in a pickle here. You shouldn't be doing this, should you? Come on, come on. I've told you before. Let's get out of here, shall we? Let's move along. I'm changing you. I've come after you. I live in you. You're in union with me. Let's go. Come on, stop that. Let's go. And he goes, no, I like doing it. And he goes, I know you do, but I'm going to change you, so you might as well start now. Come on, let's go. You can talk to him. You don't need an intermediary. That's what we are. That's what a Christian is. And lastly, offering spiritual sacrifice acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. We don't need to go to a building anymore. We don't need religious intermediaries. And we don't need the religious intermediary in a building, like the temple, to sacrifice a third-party animal so that you and me can be right with our God because Jesus died. He was the one who took it. No one else needs to die. No one else is needed as an intermediary. Me and Jesus are best buddies all the time. All the time. I'm his best friend. Do you know that? Me and Jesus are best pals. But here's the amazing thing. He can be best pals with me and you. No, no, but he really can. He's got so much love, it's scary. Scary. This is what it is to be in union, in partnership with Christ. Right. And then we have a summary of Christ building us. He's building me. House, priest, sacrifice. And then there's a beautiful summary. Look at 9 to 10. He just says it again, really. You... You. You've got to believe this about yourself, you see. If you're going to not just say, I've become a Christian, he's my foundation, if you're going to say, no, no, it's vibrant. And listen, it's not about me making it vibrant. I get really low. <laughs> no, no, it's not about me making it vibrant. It's about this. This is who I am now. And this is the key, my lovely friends. This is who you are now. Look, 9 to 10, read it with me. This is who you are in Christ. This is you. This is how God sees you right now and, because you're behaving yourself now, right? Because you're in this room, there's very limited things that you can be naughty about just here. He sees you like this all the time. All the time. You, verse 9, are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. God's special possession. Put your head in the pillow tonight. I'm God's special possession. <laughs> that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Once you weren't a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you hadn't received mercy, but now you have received mercy. So, two things, one to go. First, how does God transform our lives? Christ becomes the cornerstone, the foundation. We don't stumble over him. We dive onto him and his crucified and risen self. And his spirit comes to live in us. Two Christ starts to construct a new life. He's the lead partner. He says, come with me on this. I lead. I'll give you the allurement. Have you noticed when you've met Christ, your will changes? Yes, you do wrong things, but isn't it amazing? You feel you want to live differently, isn't it? That's what somebody who hasn't met Christ doesn't even understand. Even as you do wrong, wrong things, you want to live differently. It's his power. You see, it's his pull. It's his friendship that's doing it. A new life is built by Christ as we unite with him in partnership. So finally then, what are the implications for you and me as athletes? And I'm going to go straight to doing it as athletes. Clearly, he's not writing to athletes per se. But I'm going to use the fact that we're athletes in this room to adapt the last section now directly to our own lives, our athletic lives, because we're more than athletes, of course, but to our athletic lives, because that's one of our common grounds here today. I put it to you that to enjoy this reality, what's needed is that you've got to learn to think of yourself as you really are and act out who you are. So my third heading is 
A Christian is somebody who says, I'm going to become what I really am. Jesus, help me. Help me become the woman I actually am. Your house, your priest, your living sacrifice. That's who I am in your eyes. I've got the rest of my life to get there. Take me on the journey today. Christ is the foundation. Christ is the builder. But as Duncan told us very wisely, these readers, the original readers, were being ostracized socially and it was difficult for them. They were countercultural, and it was hard. Come with me on the last couple of verses to work out what we can do to become who we really are in our union with Christ. First, dear friends, verse 11, I urge you as foreigners and exiles. I never went on a gap year, but I spoke to enough people who did years and years ago and over the years, and they said it was mad. I went to a poor country, I came back. And my country wasn't mine. I came back and I felt like a stranger. It just looked so rich with so much choice, and I, I just felt I didn't belong anymore. I didn't quite fit in with it anymore. It was weird. I spent all my life there. I didn't belong anymore. A bit like Copernicus to Ptolemy, a bit like the jigsaw, a bit like the cornerstone. When you meet Jesus, you know the feeling, don't you? You don't quite know what's happened sometimes, if it happens later in life, but you know the world doesn't fit anymore. It's not quite right anymore. And so look what Peter says here. He says, well, you're right. I urge you. He's, he's quite firm, isn't he? I'm urging you, as a friend, I'm urging you to live to a better story. No, you don't fit here. You don't belong here. You come from another world, and one day you're going to live there forever. You've had an insight into it. Now, start living the new world in this world. Let Jesus take the lead and make you this person who you are and who you are becoming. How do I do it, Lord? Abstain from sinful desires which war against your soul. Now we're really in the heart of what we choose to do to become who we are. Sinful desires, um, actually, uh, technically, the word is over-desire. What it actually means is you're consumed with desire for things that were created, not for the creator. And as the letter goes on, Paul, uh, Peter talks about relationships, even about our talents, as we'll unpack this in the rest of the week. I think it's pretty straightforward. Let's go straight to sport. We can't help it in life. The old me, the over-desire, is pretty straightforward. It says, I have to achieve my standing in life. As an athlete, if it's going well for me, I am the good player. I have played for that team. I am in that side. I have been for selected for them. I do play there. I actually compete in that major event. I'm in the Bucks team and so on. This is who I am. My achievements define me. This is over desire. The person I'm going out with defines me. My looks define me. My cultural achievement defines me. It's very simple. Jesus won't have it. And the world that we live in can't stop itself. And I couldn't, without Christ's help, defining myself by what I achieve. But Jesus is pretty straightforward. Don't define yourself by what you achieve because you know what will happen. One day, you won't be in the team. One day, you will be injured. One day, you won't be the brightest person in the room. One day, you won't be the best looking. One day, you won't. One day, you won't. One day, you won't. And when that failure comes, where do I go now when I've tried to overachieve as a cultural achiever? and you're talented people, or you wouldn't be at university, and you wouldn't be in your sports teams, so you have got all the hallmarks of a cultural achiever. No, no, here's the gospel. Get it clear. You're not what you achieve. You are what you receive. I'm going to say it again. You're not what you achieve. It's incidental. They're gifts. They're beautiful, and we look at them when we look at some of our seminars this week. We'll keep the details for then. But for now, you're not to define yourself anymore by what you have, do, or are. You can't. Stop it. That's what Peter says. Stop it, my friend. Define yourself like this. I am what I have received. Now, I'm going to stop there. I've got a line to go, but I don't want to lose your attention. 
But what I want to end with is this. Hmm. You've had a mare. Come back with me to the start, right? No, I'll give you a real one, shall I? Oh, I've got millions of them. Oh, I've got millions of them. Let me think of one. It's so easy. All right, all right. It's like forever ago, right? I don't know. 1984, 3 0 down. 1984, 3 0 down, bottom of the championship, getting hammered in a midweek game. Standing on the left hand side of the field, left hand touchline. I know as a footballer that if I move there, the pass can't come to me because the, the, the winger's in the way. If I move there, I'm available. If I move there, I'm available. But if I move there, I'm not on for the pass. I hide. I don't go and move for the pass. Ten minutes to go, having a mare, shocking. I'm a Christian by now. Go off at the end. John, no. Dressing room, you can imagine. Da, 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 da. All that. Dano! Dano! You! Don't think I didn't see you. Hiding, not giving an angle. You bottler. You absolute bottler. You're really just and all that. Come on then, Jono. Do you want one? You crap you are anyway. You're the worst left back I've ever played with. Disaster. Nightmare. I'm having a nightmare. I'm scared. My reputation's in tatters. I might be dropped. They might not pick me again. My team's rubbish. I can't do anything. I can't beat a player. I can't get a cross in. We're losing all the time. I don't want the ball. Come on then. I'm scared. So I'm not going to serve you, mate. I'm going to survive. Do you want one? Jesus, Jesus. I'm having a mare. Five one down, ten minutes to go. Am I safe or scared? Jesus, I'm safe, I'm safe. I am the worst player in the team, but if I was the worst player in the country, you love me the same. You just love me the same. You love me the same. I can't earn it with you. I can't achieve it with you. However I'm brilliant or rubbish I am, I receive it. It's a gift. It's a gift. I can't earn it. Cultural achievement won't do it. Thank you. Thank you. Jesus. Jesus, I'm going to show, right? Jesus, I'm going to go and get the ball. Ah, crap touch. Into touch. Rubbish. Daniel, come on. Come on. Get your touch right. Doesn't matter if we fall down. Yeah, you're right, Jono. You're right, Jono. Absolutely bob on. Sorry, mate. Give it again. Give it again. Safe to serve, scared to survive, or safe to serve. How does Jesus change us? How does grace transform our lives? We work out, one, that Jesus has to be the foundation. The world won't fit without him. But two, Jesus builds us into his image in union with him. And he is committed to taking a lead to change us so that we become people who are safe to serve our club, not scared to survive. And then people will start saying, what is it with you? Why are you like this? And you'll say to yourself, oh, if only you knew I'm such a loser inside. And the Lord says, stop that. That's not who you are anymore. You are the person she saw. You are the person she saw.